doing a little channel surfing recently and I stopped on the shopping channel and the lady was the most wonderful joie de vivre I've seen in a long time. So much enthusiasm. It was like she stepped right out of the TV right in front of my couch and she wanted me to buy must-have baby shower items. Did you know that there were must-have baby shower items? The presentation was not only enlightening, it was a little bit frightening to me. You see, when I was born, during the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt, it was uh, a lot easier to move from being a baby to a, a, a toddler to, to an adult. But apparently now, you gotta have a whole lot more equipment. I even called my mom. She said, growing up in Mankato with my twin brother Tom, basically besides cloth diapers and a bottle, all we had was a single blanket. And we would lay on that blanket for endless hours trying to put our feet in our mouths or our feet in each other's mouths. And that's about all we had except when we wanted to rattle and we'd get that ourselves. We'd peel it off a rattlesnake and use that. And yeah, as I remember, we changed our own diapers back then too, I think is how I remember it. But now, to rate, they, <laughs> stimulators, transponders, transporters, they have an anti-stink device for the diaper pail, they got bath gizmos, they got a pump, I don't even want to describe to you. They've got tools and all of it is must have baby shower equipment. So I googled must have. Must have moves beyond merchandise. Did you know that before men date women they have must have lists? that they make out and the woman has to meet that and vice versa. Women have must have lists for men to meet before they'll date them. Here's the top three. Number one, slightly shorter than average height. Number two, small stocky build. And number three, they have to be a pastor. <laughs> Boy, somebody's got his back, right? Huh? <laughs> Most of the must have stuff you see, you, right away you know, I can do without that. Today, in, in one of the most fabulous sections in scripture, we're going to talk about must-haves that for heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, you must have them. And whatever you do in life, you want to hold on to these must-haves. And if by the Spirit of God you will grow in a deeper appreciation of these must-haves for as long as you live, here is what they will do by the Spirit of God. They will change your life into a, and I want to. I want to worship Jesus. I want to tell others about the joy of sins forgiven. I want to give more of my treasure. Tell me what I can do to serve my Lord. If you will live in the good of these must-haves we uncover today with the Apostle Paul, you will say, I'm all in. Christ's love compels me. I want to live for him because these truths, these ironclad, undeniable, non-negotiable must-haves hold me firm in my faith and I love my God. Just so that you see that's where Paul was headed in the text we're going to study today, let me have you, before I read the whole text, find the text. It's Titus 3, 3 through 8. You'll either find it in the service folder on page 10, or there's an insert as well. And, and look at the last verse of our short text this morning. This is what Paul says. This is a trustworthy saying. That five times in the pastoral epistles, Paul will say that whenever he says that, that you want to move to the edge of your chair mentally and you want to pay attention. That, that phrase is equivalent to a teacher saying, this will be on the final. <laughs> when a teacher says, this will be on the final, what do you do? If you don't know, that's why you repeated a lot of grades, okay? <laughs> you, you pay attention. Because what's coming is an aspect of the gospel that's non-negotiable and life-giving. And that's what he says. Look what he says. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So the question is, what is the trustworthy saying? Believe it or not, the trustworthy saying is an entire sentence in the Greek. 
One sentence that flows from three to seven and in there are the must-haves we'll uncover. And whatever you do, hold on to your must-haves. Can you say that with me? Whatever you do, hold on to your must-have. Please stand. Let me read the entirety of the text for you. This is Titus 3. It's just 3 through 8. Beautiful scripture. I'm going to start at verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But, but, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. God's word is true. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. If we wanted to identify truths that are non-negotiable in the kingdom of God, that God uses to galvanize our lives to inspire us to live for him and from this text. The first one, we, we, might, we might could phrase it like this. We cannot save ourselves as we are shot through with sin. There's just nothing within us whereby we could ever hope to save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves as we are shot through with sin. Let's say that together. We cannot save ourselves as we are shot through with sin. He employs no less than eight words in the opening verse to help us to come with David to the conclusion that against you and you only have I sinned, Lord and done what is evil in your sight, that you are proved right when you judge. And I am worthy of nothing on my own but eternal damnation. And it's ugly, but it's necessary. Because to the degree we take sin lightly is to the degree we take our Savior lightly and we take grace lightly. So look at the, look at the words. Let's just talk a little bit about it that confirm this must have. At one time we were foolish. It has nothing to do with street smarts or uh, IQ or acumen. It has everything to do with moral depravity and the density that accompanies that. Paul writes to the Romans and he says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to them. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And this is the inevitable result of all of mankind, of you, of me, when we do not have the redeeming grace of God and the sanctifying light of the Holy Spirit in our heart. We're, we're spiritual pygmies. We're moronic in our evil. And it doesn't just leave us in that stupor. It leads to action. We were disobedient disobedient. It, it's not that when you sin against God, most of the times in your life, it's not because you don't know the difference between good and good and bad, right? I know it. But I don't give a rip. I just don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. It's disobedience. That's what, that's what the result of sin in our life. We're deceived. We're deceived. We're dupes. We don't even know what we're doing where is wrong. We're lost. Have you ever been lost and not known you were lost? That ever happened to you? My dad used to have a, a Plymouth purple station wagon and we used to go on vacation every year to Michigan, Wisconsin. From North Platte, Nebraska, we'd go all the kids in the back with the blankets and build tunnels and be annoying, you know, and he's driving and he would get lost as a goose because every time he had a shortcut. And, and my mom would say, just stop and ask for directions. You know what his response was? This is classic. Did, did Lewis and Clark stop for directions? 
Oh man, you should have seen the look on my mom's face, you know. We're so deceived, we're so lost. We don't even know we're lost. That's, that's been, look at us. Look at us. We have our root spot to redefine marriage. To say to the infinite creator, no, 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 I prefer man and man and women and woman or now man and a beast. And we proclaim it right because it's right, right? We destroy the foundation of our society. Did you know that there are 56 gender choices on Facebook to fill out your page? You can choose at least 10 genders now. Do you know what a demi boy is? Neither do I, but it's a choice. Because gender is no longer a gift from God. It's my choice. I choose it. And it leads to continued dysfunction. We destroy ourselves. Come on, people. This is who we are. Uh, enslaved to all kinds of passions. You, you've never, on a late hour, all by yourself, self-medicated by watching something you shouldn't watch? Or listening to something you shouldn't listen to? And enjoyed it and put it away as if God didn't know about it? We're like putty in the hands of our own depravity. I'm so sick of feeling like a slapped puppy that did something impolite on the rug, but I can't be free from it. How will I be free from it? And then we're going to say we can save ourselves? Oh, no. The must-have to live in is stated like this. I cannot save myself. I am shot through with sin. And that's the first must-have to hold on to. And boy, if we stopped there, who would have any hope today if we all left? But look at the conjunction in the next verse. Um, Spurgeon called it an in-the-nick-of-time conjunction. <laughs> Isn't that good? In the nick of time. He also called it God's roadblock to hell. Listen. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Kindness, the, at the root of the word, is goodness. At Salem, we end every service in such a meaningful way. At the end of the service, Pastor Jeremy or myself says, God is what? Good. When? All the time. He, 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 why would God set the sun in the sky on those who betray him and defy him? Why would God give us rain and so many blessings when we too have betrayed him all week? Because God is good. He is kind. He's benevolent. He chooses. I, I will love him anyway. And then love is philanthropia. It's a, it's, one scholar says it's a, affection rooted in pity. It's the strongest. God is the highest form of philanthropy. He has affection rooted in pity. Dr. Deutschlander loves to say, this is the emotion you cause in God's heart. He sees you in your sin. And he pities you. And he has mercy for you. And he acts. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appear. When did it appear? To me, it's a reference of Christmas. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's when the kindness and love of God fleshed out. And we saw it and it appeared. So many amazing Christmas cards I got this past Christmas. Ornate ones, red, regal, gold. Uh, one when I opened it plays Silent Night like an angelic chorus. But of all the Christmas cards, this was the best one I got this year. This one's from Isabel Sieber, little Izzy. Her mom, one of our teachers, took her handprint in, in paint and put this little print on this piece of paper and put two eyes and a nose and a smile. Izzy, 2018, I love you on the back. What's so appealing about this? Why is this so meaningful? 
because you can see little Izzy with her two teeth giggling when she does this. And she gets it. Her mom explains to her, this will go to Pastor Tim. We love Pastor Tim. And she gives it to me. And it's, it's so simple. It's so warm. It's so meaningful. Children are free to love everybody. Even me. M Martin Luther in a, in a Christmas sermon, he wrote this about God's gift to us and his son. How could God have shown his goodness to us in a more sublime manner than by humbling himself to partake of flesh and blood. And he comes and he fleshes himself out and he lives a perfect life among us. And to make sure that we would know definitively that Christianity is fundamentally Trinitarian, assuring us in his love. He stands in the Jordan River and the water drips from him. He says, you baptize me. Why would I baptize you? In his own words, to fulfill all what? Righteousness. Everything that my father would have me do to be a perfect sin substitute for these people and give my life on the cross, I will do. I will do it willingly. And the Spirit shows up in a dove to confirm he's all into. And God the Father from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased because he is holy, he is innocent, he is perfect. And God the Spirit, and God the Father, and God the Son, in the most important thing ever, in your salvation, are united. Let's save them. Let's redeem them. They cannot save themselves. But we can, because salvation is God-initiated and God-accomplished. And that's the second must-have. Salvation was God initiated it. God initiated it. You're in verse 3. God is not. God is in verse 4. We are not. But when the kindness and love of God are saved. God is the actor. We did all the sinning. He did all the saving. And he even talks about the means through, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It calls to mind those words to Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, how, how can I be born again? And Jesus said, flesh gives best birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You're born again through water and the Spirit and the Word right there. That's what happened. A, a miracle greater than Lazarus coming back from the dead. It's a miracle where we get eternal life. And with God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit, just as that is baptism, are there and give us that gift. And so we can live in this must-have all of our days, which transforms us into want to. Is it any wonder that he ends uh, Romans 11 by moving into Romans 12 and saying, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice to God. So in a roundabout way, these are the must-haves we reviewed. We, we cannot save ourselves as we are shot through with sin. The second must-have is this. Salvation was God accomplished, God initiated, and God accomplished. And Christianity is fundamentally Trinitarian. I, I need to show you that from the text or you'll think I was just bringing it in with the church here. Look at verse 5, the last sentence in verse 5. It says, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the he doesn't refer specifically to the person of the Trinity that is the Holy Spirit. And then verse 6, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ. So the he refers to God the Father. Do you see the Trinitarian formula there? It's beautiful. He, God the Father, saved us. He's the, su he's the supplier or the instigator, let's say. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He's the applier whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ. 
So God the Father instigates, the Holy Spirit applies, and Jesus Christ has supplied. God the Father, God the Son, God is fundamentally Trinitarian in assuring us that these must-haves are certain certainties that we can cling to. There was this uh, elderly man and he uh, was wealthy beyond means and he loved art. He was widowed in his 60s and he threw his passion into art. He would buy priceless art from all over the world. Monet, Rembrandt, Van Gogh and he had a boy and he taught this boy to love art. The boy loved art. He learned to, to be travel the world and lecture on art and in their family estate they had millions of dollars worth of priceless art. And in 1914, the world was engulfed in war, and the boy got called away to war. And three months later, he got word that his boy had been killed on the front line. And the father was shell He didn't know how he was going to go on. And about two weeks after he got word that his boy had been killed, there was a knock on the door, and he went to the door, and there was a soldier holding a, a painting wrapped in, in brown paper. And he let him in, and the, and the boy, through tears, said... I was your son's best friend and I was the one he was trying to save when he stepped on a landmine and he died. And they hugged and they talked and the old man asked, what's the painting? And he said, it's my gift to you. And it was the most beautiful painting of his son. He captured the glint in his eye, the strongness of his chin. All of his features were captured in this amazing painting and the father was so grateful and the man left and he put it over his fireplace. It was, oh man, Rembrandt meant nothing to this painting. It was his most treasured possession. Well, the old man died and the auction came for all of these paintings, millions of dollars worth. People came from all over the world to bid on these priceless pieces. The auctioneer started the auction. The first painting was which one? Painting of his boy. Man, you should have heard the murmur in the crowd. It was like a too long Lutheran sermon and the people are complaining under their breath, you know? Hey, what's going on here? And they wanted them to auction it real quick and get rid of it so they could, and, and, and not auction it at all. And the auctioneer said, according to his will, we have to auction this piece first. Or you don't get any of the pieces. So do I have 50 quid? And someone bit 50 quid and it didn't go higher than that. The painting sold of the sun sold for 50 quid. Oh, now we can get to the real treasures banged the gavel and then he said the auction is now over because according to the will the one who gets the son gets everything it's theological truth John said to those who received him to those who believed on his name he gave the right to become children of God children born not of natural descent nor by human decision nor by will but born of God. And that is who we are. And all the wealth is heaven. Justified heir of God forever. All in these must-haves that you and I want to hold on to all our days as they transform us into Christians who want to. Amen.